that's fine. Um, my name is Dolan Cummings. I'm an associate fellow at the Institute of Ideas. Um, I'm involved in these debates for some time. In, in 2007, we did a, a, a series of debates at the Battle of Ideas called the Battle for Music, looking at various aspects of the uh, debates around music. And this kind of continues on that. Um, and this uh, session is in partnership with the Royal Philharmonic Society. Um, uh, and Tom Hutchinson from, uh, has been involved um, with Battle of Ideas um, previously. Um, and we're keen to continue that kind of um, debate. Um, more immediately, some of you may have been in the previous session in this room um, on opera and how opera is justified, how it's valued. Um, one aspect of that debate that came up was the question of whether opera might um, be useful in social terms, in t uh, um, helping the homeless um, in terms of developing their self-esteem, giving them the potential to move on in their lives, helping younger people and so on. And certainly across the arts, I think, there's, a, there's a, a, an argument that the, the, that the arts can be useful in ways that perhaps are not appreciated um, in, in changing people's lives. Um, not just um, as an aesthetic experience, but it's something people can get involved in and so on. Uh, controversial perhaps in that others say that does this distract from the aesthetic experience um, or does it um, put an unfair burden on the arts to prove their utility in ways that they're not suited to do? So that's the, the topic. Um, let me introduce the panel in the order that they're going to speak. Um, first on my right will be Tom Hutchison, um, who's a clarinetist at the Britain Sinfonia teacher and arts project uh, coordinator with the Royal Philharmonic Society. Um, second on my far right is Nicola Colleen, who's the director and CEO of Systema Scotland. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, Systema Scotland is a, 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 an initiative based on the Venezuelan experience of El Sistema, um, um, which used, um, uh, got young people, um, often from deprived backgrounds, involved in orchestral music um, uh, and has been a huge success emulated around the world. So Nicola could tell us how that's gone in Scotland. Um, third on my left will be um, Alan Miller, who's a co-director of the New York Salon and co-founder of London's Truman Brewery and Vibe Bar, and also a London member of the Arts Council of England. Um, and fourth, um, um, between Tom and Nicola, is Alexandra Lamont, uh, who's senior lecturer in psychology of music at Keele University. And then finally, I'm not in your printed programs, um, but very pleased to have uh, Tom Service. Just came off the street, actually. He just came off the street, yes. This is a, an outreach project. Um, yeah, exactly. I'm a, I'm a great beneficiary already. Uh, Tom will be known to many of you who read The Guardian or listen to Radio 3 as a, as a leading observer and commenter on um, uh, music. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Um, Tom, would you like to go first? Yeah, fine. Is that all right for the level? Yeah, I think it is. Um, two of my earliest memories um, when I was learning my instruments were workshops, visiting musicians um, coming into the school from Opera North and from the east of Yorkshire, which is, as anyone knows, quite remote, um, and then also working with second, secondary school pupils. Um, and, and these were important because you know, they were social experiences as well as musical experiences. And even now, after spending many years in the profession, they still are in my brain and something which I recall. Um, so it, I think it's obvious that music is a social activity though not exclusively, um, indeed with the advent of iPods, we are all forming and nurturing, evolving our own musical worlds independently. But certainly my formative years of training, both pre-conservatoire and at college, were socially based. I went to the Guildhall. Um, I, you, know, you meet new friends, you discourse between uh, musicians, um, you play in youth orchestras. And I was lucky to start learning music and instruments at the tail end of a golden age of music provision from the LEAs in the late 80s, early 90s, unfortunately much of which does not exist anymore. Of course, in recent years, the music scene, particularly education, has seen a number of new initiatives targeting a number of different areas. We've got In Harmony, Systema Scotland with the Big Noise Project, we've got Sing Up, Wider Opportunities, The Music Manifesto. The sort of list seems to be endless or keep on evolving. This has been helped, I think, by many people, but certainly I want to mention Classic FM, its six million audience, and more specifically the active nature of its managing director, Darren Henley, who has championed a number of these schemes and has just been, as some of you will know, charged to head a review of music teaching by the Education Secretary, Michael Gove, a collaboration between the Department of Education and DCMS. I'm not going to comment on my views on that, but that's the state of play. Um, I think this is long overdue. The overall, overall state of music teaching in this country is and I mean this kindly, patchy. Um, I've got down three reasons at first, although there are many more. Firstly, to do with teacher training, um, specifically in the primary education um, sector. 
a lot of music education is delivered through non-specialists. Um, and certainly, the music specialists I've talked to and non-music specialists in primary education feel very unconfident, or many of them do. Um, if you study the PGC PGCE, I think this is still correct, um, after I've talked to Lucy Bell at the Institute of Education, you only get around eight hours of tuition on music through your whole time on the PGCE. Um, secondly, the music curriculum is quite vague, um, particularly in secondary education. That could be liberating, or seem to be liberating, but also um, the opposite too. And thirdly, of course, a lack of money. This in itself creates a vicious cycle as the schools then expect the young musicians, workshop leaders, professionals to come in and do this creative work in projects, which overall tend to be very limited in scope and ambition, but more importantly, do not transfer the skills onto the teachers. So therefore, schools increasingly need to bring in people from the outside. Where is the sense of community? Where is the building of a long-lasting program of music making? More specifically with classical music, a number of issues crop up. Should the orchestras and arts organisations be asked to do more work in this field, when ultimately their main aim is to provide excellent quality music making? Indeed, is this compromised because musicians have so much to do these days, and paid so little? And is this filling the gap for a more comprehensive and holistic musical curriculum and social agenda, agenda which, the curricula, which the government is not providing? Many of these projects talk about musical experiences, but what about ongoing musical development? Other musical genres can often just do just as much. Learning the electrical guitar or how to use a mixing desk is equally as challenging as the violin. One must be very wary, however, that classical music or music making in general is seen as the ultimate panacea. Many other art forms can produce excellent community and social benefit too, theater, dance. But does this kind of creative project work fall down in its ambition and legacy? And is this a symptom of Br British mediocrity? I have spent quite a bit of time in the US lately and their sense of confidence and enthusiasm and ambition within the educa education system is positively radiant. When it comes to government, it is not surprising that they latch onto a good idea, is it? Are we really surprised? The lack of original thinking within the government is vast. When Venezuela successfully showcased El Sistema, it would probably be absurd for a government not to highlight it. Yet, is it not the case that El Sistema really came to the fore when their wonderful orchestra, headed by Dudamel, toured and showcased their talents around the world? This is an indirect, albeit wonderful, result, and it remains to be seen whether the years of hard work and ethics of the system can be translated and fed into an education system, for this is where the knowledge needs to be integrated. Undoubtedly, we are heading for a number of fallow years ahead with RE funding, and if these national projects are needed to help raise the profile of music, then why not? We should be pleased that the music world is being proactive. But let's try and share and start to crystallize the knowledge from these different areas, so that music indeed the arts, have a clearer and more defined place within the curriculum, then we could see, indirectly, a social benefit that evolves out of our own system. Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Nicola, you talk to us. Okay. Um, Sistema Scotland is a charity, and it was formed in 2007 to specifically pilot the Venezuelan model El Sistema in Scotland. Therefore, we absolutely sign up to the founder, Maestro Jose Antonio Abreu's belief that the orchestra is a very unique an incredibly powerful tool of mankind to literally unite people and to create positive social change. But I want to start not with words from him, but actually words from the parents of the Raplock community. Raplock is a community in the heart of Scotland and it's historically been known as one of the most deprived areas in Scotland. But we think, we hope, that it's becoming more well known now for its children's orchestra there. And this is where our pilot programme, The Big Noise, is, is delivered. A couple of months ago, I asked some of the parents in the Raplock community, I was applying for some funding, and I said, do you know, usually I ask our partners for support, but w you know, you're our partner, so would you be interested in coming together and writing a letter of support for the work that we're doing? And this is me, I'm kind of paraphrasing here some of what the letter said. It said, the Big Noise Orchestra truly is for everyone. It's free. It doesn't matter about age, race, religion. Some children in this community are fostered and being part of the orchestra has meant they can, can be, still be connected to their community. Parents can contribute by being volunteers in the programme or by playing in the adult orchestra. But the most important phrase for me in this was, the big noise is making our community a family again. This was quite a, a particularly emotional letter for me to receive and to read because it was almost like all of the things that you hope when you begin to develop some work, you're seeing the seeds of it and you're hearing it through peop other people's voices. 
So what exactly do we do at Big Noise? Well, when we started in 2008 in the community, there was one child who was learning an instrument that we were told. We now work with over 300 children every week and parents and volunteers from out with the community as well as within. If you live in Rathlock and you're a child, then basically you can enter the Big Noise programme in nursery and you have musicianship sessions with the Big Noise musicians once a week. When you go into primary one at five years old, you have orchestra initiation twice a week where you have a continuation of musicianship. You then choose which string instrument you'd like to play. You make a replica of that instrument and you join the paper orchestra, which is literally, if you're um, at this size, because you're five and you need a 16 size violin, you make a 16 size paper violin and join the paper orchestra. And by the end of the primary one year, you've exchanged that for a real string instrument and you form the primary one orchestra. We have a special educational needs strand because we believe that the orchestra should be for everyone. So the children in the special educational needs school have creative music making using technology to enable them to make music. But we also use a different notation system called figure notes for some of the children to learn how to read music and how to play an instrument in a different way. And some of those children are then in the community orchestra as well. At the ripe old age of six years old, you can opt to join the community orchestra. And last year, 80% of children in primary one opted to join and continued to play in the community orchestra. And really, that's where we start to grow from. So at six years old, you can join that and you can stay in it ultimately until you decide you would like to leave. At the moment, we have children in that orchestra from six to 11 years old. That's the age that we started with, but those children, we're progressing as they grow. The, Amer the Venezuelan system is very much about immersion. So we, that community orchestra meets three days a week after school from quarter past three until six o'clock. But in Venezuela, they meet six days a week, four hours a day. So we had to think of other creative ways that we could bring people together. So we have an adult orchestra, we have performances for and by the children regularly, we have a volunteers programme, and we have a really successful concert series called Take a Musician Home for Tea where children can literally book their music teacher to go into their house and to perform a concert for them, or their granny, their neighbours, anyone that they want to bring round. So that's just a taster of what actually happens at Big Noise in the Rathbok community. But I believe that anyone working in the arts, and particularly in arts education, intrinsically understands the power and the social benefits. But what I feel about the Venezuelan system is that it is an exemplar, and it's an exemplar of what absolutely can be what can be achieved if you have absolute commitment to this. I believe that there are some key elements of it that really demonstrate both why this type of work is so valuable to our society, but also if it becomes defined by policy or if it becomes owned by government, how it could also potentially constrain its potential. El Sistema is built on leadership, intensity and activity, immersion and the creation of an alternative community through the orchestra. More than this, it's about absolute ambition and absolute belief in the capacity of people and the capacity of children to be great and to create great things. It's about using the orchestra to generate self-discipline, teamwork, cooperation and belief in a goal higher than oneself. It pursues absolute excellence. There is no compromise over the aesthetic and artistic goals. And it believes that it's through the pursuit of that excellence. Maybe you'll achieve it, but it's absolutely through the pursuit of that excellence that only then can true capacity be realized. And all of this is pursued in a community environment. But the challenges then are that it's also completely organic and evolutionary. It's always moving. It's always changing. It challenges us constantly as a new young organization. And just to give you a little anecdote, we recently had a residency by a quartet from Venezuela and they found it so interesting how our culture as an organisation was defined on structure and timetables and having starting times for people and stopping times. And they were saying, but why do you have to have this? Why can you not just be more organic? And then one of the Venezuelan musicians, to prove his point, brought me in a video of one of the children who was actually saying at the end of a session, but why do we need to stop? We haven't got the music right yet. And they were saying, why are you stopping? So that's a challenge to how we structure our organisations. But more than this, I think the challenge for making this policy is, it's, is that it's about slow, long-term generational change. It's not a quick fix. It requires dedication, commitment, risk-taking and absolute belief in the long-term goals. So when we talk about this in terms of policy making, do we have a political system that can take its time to allow this to happen? 
So at Systema Scotland, we're prepared to take on this challenge. We want to commit to the long term. We truly believe if we can invest in this and prove this point, then we'll not just be proving this for ourselves, but for everyone else who works in arts education. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Alan. Thanks. <coughs> I think we live in a, a strange world today where many of the ideas that had formed the basis for how we understood the world previously have seemed to be corroded or at least seen in a very problematic way. So dedication to goals, authorship and authority, expertise and excellence are often seen as problematic, even egotistical elements and sometimes even representing a certain human hubris. It's with this in mind that I come to the question that we're thinking about today. Because it was generally accepted for a very long period that to become accomplished in an area, artistic or other, would require enormous amounts of dedication, application and hard work. It was viewed that within society and promoted by the ruling establishment that beginning to master a musical instrument, for instance, and voice was something of value in and of itself, regardless of any specific outcomes elsewhere. That learning the piano, for instance, would sharpen one's, one's ear and, one, and mind and senses and appreciation of culture, and through that, one would have gained something significantly and in that sense become a fuller, more developed human being. To attempt Bach on the cello or to be in an orchestra and play as part of an ensemble was something that would leave a mark for life. This experience could tell you more about the vital relationship between an individual and the group, working as a team and being responsible and doing the best that you possibly can than any lecture possibly could. But it was premised on self-discipline and musical excellence first. Such excellence also makes the audience better as it happens. However, a result of a combination of a number of ongoing things often referred to within the context of the culture wars, where Western society has become disillusioned with some of the achievements of civilization, a term that in and of itself has become significantly challenged, uh, alongside decreasing funding for the liberal arts and education, and a climate where it's seen unhelpful to push young people beyond their expectations and set high benchmarks that require them to really stretch and push themselves, has meant that we've achieved a point where where a significant detrimental impact has uh, occurred on music, both classical and, as it happens, contemporary in Britain and beyond. Married alongside this has been the uh, ever-decreasing popularity of mainstream politicians, a sense that they're all just the same and that politics and thus politicians are all very much untrustworthy, greedy, generally liars and often uh, corrupt. The leaders seem to have lost their way, and in fact, even the idea of leadership is seen as a very troubled concept. In our post-ideological climate, where politicians have become bureaucratic tinkerers, they've been desperate to cling to things that seem popular with the general public. Hence the dreadful Cool Britannia moment of the 90s, and even more worrying, the slow, relentless encroachment of instrumentalist outlooks and objectives that are stamped on music today from many quarters. Now, a key point here. Music should be held up, loved, criticised, experienced to the blender, the splendour, ardour at its best, incredible epitome of everything that is special in the world. But it should be done so on its own terms. It should not be that it serves to promote any campaigns in particular, whether it's for anti-racism, for equal op opportunity, for reducing poverty or street crime or solving any other issues in society. Really, that's called politics. And for that, we need transformative ideas and people willing to implement them to overcome obstacles. Imposing this on music, it seems to me, only erodes the importance of music, and it does little more than pay lip service to society's problems either. So the fashion to flatter young people and students today does nothing to help to promote a vibrant and dynamic musical scene. Rather, it often patronises them. So rather than showing them a glimpse of who they can become by putting in the tough work and experiencing firsthand the payoff that is not financial or celebrity-driven, but spiritual, perhaps, in its truest secular sense, we often find that adults are so compromised by the sense that our cultural canon is one of compromised of dead white males who, who raped and pillaged the world and, and do not have the vocabulary or the cultural backup of their colleagues and society to declare what is so great about great music and hard work needed to achieve excellence. So it was, for instance, when I was visiting one of the London universities a while back to give a talk, I was greeted by the Chancellor, who excitedly informed me that they were aiming to be more like the vibe bar at the university, with DJs and cultural happenings. When he saw my look of horror, he was surprised. I told him that I thought he should leave it up to us to do entertainment and the university to be a place of education. And this was met with a somewhat befuddled uh, look. He may be expecting me to do some kind of body popping or some kind of cultural groovy thing with him, 
But the point being that our cultural leaders are embarrassed about our culture and history in many instances, and often are desperate to be relevant. But all too often, this is like your very uncle uncle dancing at a party. Contemporary popular music has suffered dramatically within all of this, for sure. I mean, where once bands would struggle and tour and record labels would sign up for six or eight albums and they would cut their teeth and improve gradually, the descent of record labels and their feverish attempt to hit big on the first track has resulted in enormous pressure to hit, to hit the first single and hit millions. While there are, of course, still very talented artists, the fact that classical music has suffered in education and lost its recognition as in importance and worthwhile in its own right has had a major impact on all musicians. It's one thing to challenge a form once you have become well-versed in it. It's entirely another never to have understood it and simply to aim for becoming a celebrity pop artist without ever learning your craft. We are hard pushed to find the kind of great musicians of the 60s and the 70s, and that's got a lot to do with the collapse of classical music training and it being prized in society so highly. While the cultural gatekeepers sometimes mouth the words of great art and excellence, the core beliefs betray the reality. Popularity and immediate, immediate success is seen as proof in the pudding, whereas diligence, hard work, application and persistence are less attractive notions. Many have pointed to the success of El Sistema in Venezuela, and it is truly uh, inspiring. The fact now I hear it's got more than 500,000 Venezuelan, Venezuelan children involved from a range of backgrounds and over 30 symphony orchestras. However, while I'd welcome investment in musical education, and as it happens, the more the better, we need to tackle some, other, some of the other issues that are specific to Britain and the West around the issue of the culture of low expectations, a fear of standards and quality, anxious leadership, and a tick box, tick box, tick box mentality. A final note on this. It's impossible, pretty much, to apply for any arts funding of any kind without having to go through the motions of ticking boxes and making it appear correct that you as an arts organisation are, are handling a range of social issues, whether it's equality or social inclusion. This is an outrage, where the politicians have been unable to win arguments about changing society significantly and instead have us all sign off on platitudes that do little to change reality but place an enormous pressure on the arts. Let's have more music for its own sake, to relish the beauty and the wonder of it, and then if we want to change the world, let's go off and do that separately. Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, Alexander. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm kind of coming at this from a rather different point of view from everybody else because I'm an academic researcher but I'm also a musician and all the projects that I'm talking about have got to do with music. Um, but I just wanted to talk about the, the, the potential for music to, ch to change people. Um, over ten years ago I was involved in a task group that was drafting the national curriculum for music and we sat around a table and we said what do we say at the beginning what can we say that's going to get people excited about music music is going to be within the curriculum I mean it had been in the national curriculum since 1988 we were looking at the revisions at the turn of the century it had been in the curriculum but it was still being treated as sort of a second-class subject relegated to a Friday afternoon um, and there was this kind of sense of wanting to say something. And we wrote a statement, um, my colleague David Hargreaves, I think, came up with the first version of this, uh, that's, that goes along the lines of music has the power to change the way we think, we act, we feel, something like that. Um, and we made this statement to try to, to give music a bit more status. Um, because it's true, it does. There are plenty of research studies that have been done over the last few years looking at exactly how music can change all of those things. Um, but actually, I think we might have been barking up the wrong tree with this because music then has been seen as something, as a tool to achieve other goals. And I fundamentally think this is wrong. Um, we've got a lot of research on the effects of music, some surprising results that show that music does affect the way we feel, uh, that we can be made to feel more happy by listening to something that's cheerier. Um, we can, uh, music listening has been shown to activate all the bits of the brain that are also activated by food, by sex, by drugs. Um, so music is a, has powerful physical effects on us. Um, but we, we have this kind of sense of let's listen to lots of music then because it's going to be good for us. And this can sometimes lead to some problems with, for example, not learning how to actually listen to music. Our research shows that most people listen to music and nothing else about 10% of the time. 
So 90% of people's music exposure is while they're doing something else. And most of the time, they're probably not paying very much attention to the music. So by having music all around us with the technological advancements, we're actually maybe not engaging with the music in quite the same way. Um, although going to live events, we find from our studies, is a really good way of having that focused level of engagement. And people tell us amazingly detailed stories about experiences that they've been to in live music. So I think that's very encouraging as a message for those people who are involved in promoting live music. Um, if we think about making music, I wanted to share a little bit of research with you. A study that was done originally in the, in the States, and we've just replicated it with my students at Kiel. Um, we got people to do the hokey cokey. And they did it in pairs, and they did it in a class for me. Um, it's a nice way to start a Thursday morning. And uh, people were dancing, and they were, in every pair, one of the people was in on the study, and they knew what the point of it was. The other person wasn't, and they didn't know what was going on. So the person who was in on it was either instructed to dance and do the right movements at the same time as the other person who had a sheet with all the actions on it, um, or they were supposed to do the opposite action. So while you put your right arm in, they put their left leg in. And that was all that was different in the two groups. So we had one group of people dancing and singing in synchrony in a pair, and the other group of people where they did it differently. And then I gave them a problem-solving task, and the person who was in on the study was told, suggest to your partner that you cheat. Um, and it actually had some impossible tasks in it that they couldn't have solved, and we, we encouraged them to cheat. And the people who were doing the dancing and singing in synchrony were much more likely to cheat because they'd done something with somebody that was in time, in tune, shared actions. And just that little experience, they didn't know each other, just that little experience in the classroom actually made them behave in a different way. Not something that we would necessarily want to promote. But on the other hand, making music is, together is a very, very powerful experience. So we can look at the ramifications of that over a much longer period of time. Um, so... Music can do all these things, but are we doing it for those things or are we doing it for the music? There are two points I wanted to make. Um, the first one is that the main purpose of any kind of musical activity really has to be about the music. The music has to come absolutely first and probably only, I think. Um, there's a lot of work in community psychology and community arts um, that shows that the arts activities are often only a reason for bringing people together and that the reason that people benefit from those things is because they've sat in a room and they've done something together. But for music, that's almost never the case. People who are involved in community music groups talk about the music as being the reason that they're there. The other things come afterwards and they, they can come in very unpredictable ways. So it's not possible to put somebody in a choir and say, well, this is going to be good for your breathing. It might be, but it might not be, and it might be that it's better for their social interaction, or it might be that they make a friend, or it might be that they have, uh, they're able to exercise their brain patterns to, to try and remember the words and try and remember the songs. And there could be all sorts of benefits that are going to come, and they're not predictable. Um, so, the, so the main purpose of making music, I think, has got to be musical. And we know this from some research in the States, which has been done on music, um, tr music training and non-musical skills, particularly with populations like Head Start, where there's sort of similar sorts of disadvantaged populations. And they've been given lots of music lessons in an attempt to try and raise their academic achievement. And it works really well to start with. Um, but after about three years, it stops working. And the effects seem to kind of wash out, if you like. The, the children who didn't have the training have caught up, and the children who did have the training have got to the level of, and sort of plateaued, if you like. So music can do things, but in very limited ways, and sometimes in ways that we don't really understand very well. And if we build a program on the basis that it's going to bring math skills improvements or social skills improvements, and then it fails to deliver on those, then we've lost any kind of credibility because we haven't even got the extra musical benefits. Um, so, it's a, dangerous, it's a dangerous course to tread here. The second thing that I wanted to make, the second point I wanted to make is about choice. And there have been, as Tom said, a, a mass of educational innovations trying to bring music to children, to more children. Um, things like wider opportunities, which for those of you who don't know, is primary schools in England and Wales, uh, children are given the opportunity to learn an instrument in a class. So we've taken a traditional model of one-to-one -one or small group teaching and you put it in a group situation and you have 36 children who learn the violin for a year when they're seven because that's the way it's structured. There's a lot of government money that's been put into this scheme and I've been involved in evaluating some of the schemes that have run across the country. Um, on one level, it's a great idea, and it's similar to the principles of El Sistema and to the big noise work that Nicola's been talking about, in that it makes music something that everybody does, and it's not an exclusive activity, and that's great. It sends all those positive messages. 
Um, but on the other hand, there are children, and there will always be children, who are not interested in making music and who really don't care. And as Alan was saying, music is something that takes a lot of effort to be good at, and I think we have to recognise that. You don't get very far uh, in 30 minutes a week for a year when you're seven and there are 35 other people in the class with you, and there's only two members of staff, and they're more used to dealing with you on a one-to-one, -one, and they don't really know how to manage the class. This is not necessarily a very rewarding experience, but it's quite a costly one. And so I think we want to be thinking about... Um, what we do for those children who maybe aren't interested in that sort of stuff, our research tends to show about a third of children are a bit switched off of, from music, and of course we should be giving them the opportunity so that if they do want to take it, they can flourish. But we also need to be saying that it's okay not to do this. There are lots of people who don't do this, um, and we need to be sensitive to the kind of benefits that we're looking at. Some work that we've done with older populations looking at community choirs, as I said before, all these wonderful benefits that people get from it. But these are people who have chosen to go. Nobody said to you, right, well, it's, it's Tuesday morning and you can't have your pension until you've gone and done the choir. This is something that people have decided to go to. And they get very engaged in it. And some of them have never done any music making in their whole lives. And they come to it in their 70s or their 80s and get enormous benefit from the musical activities and from all the other things. And I think that's fantastic. But they've chosen to do it. So I think it's really, really important that we don't kind of take these, these principles so far that we're making people do things that they don't want to do. It's nice to hear that in the big noise the children are able to choose their instruments. In the whole class teaching that we looked at, a lot of the children at the end of the year said, I really like music, yes, I'd like to carry on with this, but I don't want to play the violin anymore. <laughs> so we're a bit in danger of kind of creating another, a, another generation who are just as switched off about classical musical instruments as we have had in the past with generations of kids who are bored with the recorder. We've got to be careful about the way that this happens and including some choice in it I think is critical. So just to sum up then, music for music's sake, the other stuff will come anyway. Um, but let's not measure it on the other stuff. Let's measure it for being musical, authentic musical experiences and let's involve an element of choice. Okay, thank thanks. Um, and finally, Tom, your thoughts please. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll make my remarks uh, a little briefer since I agree with uh, an awful lot of what's been said. Uh, look, should music be a tool of social policy? Self-evidently not. Um, it, ca it can't be something at a government level where we say music has to be used only because of, uh, because of its social benefits, as we've just said. The point being, as I think we've all basically made, is that the social benefits that accrue to music making happen through the doing of music. Uh, the one is indivisible from the other. An emphasis on doing music is almost by definition to do social interaction to do politics, to do relationships with people without those things being uh, the a priori uh, goal of the thing. Just um, a little example, though, about this thing. I'm wary, I think, to focus too much on classical music, but nonetheless it's sort of where I come from and what I uh, write about and talk about quite a lot of the time. There's a good example of, um, in London at least, of where... Um, how music, classical music, has been used in a way really quite successfully as a tool of social policy. I'm talking about anyone who's used the tube, uh, the Victoria Line particularly, over the last few months. It's slightly less prevalent now than it used to be, actually. I get on the tube at Brixton, you get classical music played. Now, the reason that that's happening is because it was viewed by Transport for London as, uh, and had been shown, uh, thanks to some, I say some work, but, or you could say some Stalinist social engineering that had been done in America to show that if you play classical music, if you pump out, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and in fact a 40-hour playlist. You're liable to uh, make um, the so-called rebellious, problematic aspects of society, so teenage groups of gangs or whatever, um, uh, go away from major transport outlets to presumably do their uh, criminality or ASBO <laughs> offending things somewhere else. Now, in a certain, to, the, the problem with this actually isn't, isn't so much that it doesn't work, but that it does. Um, it ha has had the effect of... Um, of, of, so noxious of the associations of classical music in particular become uh, to a generation or generations of people that they simply don't want to be anywhere that this is being played because they don't want to associate with the values that, that, it, that it's seen to represent. Um, I was struck by this listening to... Uh, it, yeah, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is a very good example of this. I went out... I, uh, I got on in the morning... Well, it was one of those rare days I had to go and do some proper work in the morning. And uh, I... Um, first movement of Beethoven 9 was playing. I came back at 5 o'clock and the last movement was playing. So it was a, I had a brilliant sort of circular form in, in the day. But the, the moment, the passage that was playing as I got on the tube was the development section of the first movement, which is an, a gigantic first inversion D major chord of violent, cathartic, coruscating power. It's a moment that Susan McClary in 1987, an American musicologist, complained to, uh, as compared to the fulfilment of male rape fantasies. Is that what you were saying about... <laughs> But it struck me as an irony that this was sort of been using, uh, using as a community or traffic calming measure. Uh, uh, that this, this moment of music uh, that, that to some people represents these violent sexual fantasies or 
violence at least, represents only a sort of placid uh, social calming mechanism uh, to most people. And I think the, the, the problems for this are exactly what we were saying about the idea of listening. I mean, it's apparently impossible for most people to actually hear what, what's going on in this music, which happens to be classical music, because all we hear is surface. Now, I don't want to say that in our education system we should, we should prioritise classical music above everything else. Absolutely not. It has to be about music education, uh, which is about the development of skills that go across all genres and allow you to enrich your life in all sorts of ways. But nonetheless, it's fairly extraordinary that uh, that, 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 that association is there. And I definitely think one of the reasons for that is, of course, what's happened in music education more generally over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, final thing to say, though, is I think uh, those of us, again, speaking from classical music, uh, side of things. I think we're all res we're partly responsible for this as well. I think for and this in a way might seem to go against uh, something that other people have said. The problem with classical music is that it's seen by its critics, by its broadcasters, by its uh, apologists in the culture. Either that we have to apologise for it and say, look, th look, it's meaningful because this does something to you, this can change your society, rather than saying, isn't this amazing stuff that we should be proud of and simply do? And the way we talk about it, on the other hand, the way we talk about it, the way we think about it, and the way we, too often it's, it's out there in the media, is as something which is sequestered away from the world as if it didn't matter, as if it didn't, in fact, change people's lives. So, um, uh, that's the, my reflections on classical music. There's probably a lot of contradictions there, and I look forward to teasing them out now. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. That's great. We'll, we'll, we'll do that then. Before I come to the audience, just to tease out a couple of points that have um, come up. Um, I mean, Alan made the point, and others have agreed, that, um, that music is difficult and takes um, a lot of work, um, and perhaps clashes with um, a, a, a cultural trend now to, to want instant gratification, the kind of X-factor idea that you're, you're an instant genius, um, I need adulation rather than working at something. So, I mean, really to, uh, to, to Tommy H and Nicola, is that something that you recognize? Has it been a problem? Um, and, you know, is, is, is the fact that um, British school kids expect to leave when the bell rings rather than when they've nailed that passage, um, is that a, is that, has it been a problem? Well, I want to go back to the example I used earlier on. I think that the challenge is actually the expectations that the adults place in the children, not what the children place in themselves. Like that little girl who said, but I'm not ready to start, stop working. I want to work harder. I think our children want to do it. They want to be pushed. So I think that the fact that it's difficult is a good thing, and they're absolutely ready for the challenge. Hmm, what, what, what do you, I mean, it's quite... Um, Alexandra made the point that about a third of people are not interested in music. You've got it down to a fifth, 20%, so that's, that's good. But what, what does turn them off? Um, I mean, is it problematic? Is it, do they get grumpy and upset, or how does that work? Um, I think, I mean, we absolutely sign up to as well that for some children that's just not the thing, and that's okay, and I think choice is very important. Um, but I think it's about, you know, I mentioned earlier about leadership, about the role models, about who is delivering it, about how you make it um, both challenging but interesting and stimulating for, for young people. I shy away from using the word fun because I think that makes us think it has to be in a certain way, but it absolutely has to be challenging as well. Um, so I think for me, the other thing is um, when we talk about people wanting to be there and choosing to be there, what I feel very passionately about is that when you work in areas of deprivation, that there are so many barriers for young people as well, that you have a responsibility as an organisation to understand how can young people choose to be there as well, and how do you strip away every single barrier that might be in place. Um, so it's not just about making it free, it's about understanding the home environment, understanding the chaos that exists there. And so for some young children, particularly at such a young age, you literally have to re reach into the home and bring them out. Um, so I think, again, it's a, always a balance um, about choice, but also understanding the barriers in every single sense and how you support them to be involved. Mm -hmm. can, can I just, can, how, how do you do that with classical music? I mean, do, do you do the kind of a brave thing of saying, look, classical music can change the world, this orchestra can change society? Is that where you, you know, is that, that's presumably not how you get the kids into, uh, into the big noise orchestra at the beginning. I mean, I, is there a problem getting over the classical music barrier in rap blocks? We found absolutely no problem at all about the fact that this was an orchestra. And we don't even use the term classical music. We said, we would like to set up a children's orchestra. We think it's going to be great. Would you be interested in this? And the community said, absolutely, yes. This sounds like a great opportunity. We took members of the community to see, to see the Simon Bolivar Youth Orchestra rehearse. Um, and one of the parents came back and wrote an article for the community newspaper that said, when I heard this orchestra, I cried and I wept. And I thought, perhaps one day our children can be that good. 
Um, we also were very careful about who we recruited to deliver this programme. So the musicians themselves, it, it's about their passion for what they do because they're passing on that passion, their ability to be great communicators, educators, their, their social skills themselves um, and how they relate to other people. So I really think, again, it's about human nature. Um, and then if you're passionate about something, you often pass that on to other people. Tom, what, what do you make of that? I mean, you, you, is, is it not really a cultural problem? Is it, are ch children and other people happy to be pushed into music or is there? Um, I think young children love music. And certainly from my experience, both in education and project work and, and teaching. Certainly, I don't know, years three, four, um, so these sort of like seven, eight, nine-year-olds, they, they like music generally. I, I've, I've not really come across this big aversion to classical music. You just talk about music and they, and they get it and they just like it. I mean, maybe Alex might talk a little bit later about how peer pressure and, and moods and, and different age ranges change. And there you, there you are up against some stigma. So I think there has to be some provision there. But I mean, as Alex says, you've just got to be sensitive about it. And this idea about X factor and dedication it's not to say that those people who are dedicated and were willing to put in the time don't dream of being the next, I don't know, whoever your favorite amazing classical star is. It just means that they know that they have to do all the dedication. They still might expect that. So I think that's something just to bear in mind. Um, yeah, someone else. Okay, Alex. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think actually some, in some ways the X Factor stuff is, is, has changed the way that people see what's, what is going on. I mean, the, I think previous to this, most people thought that success of, of being a pop star was just kind of chance, or you were brilliant, one or the other. But I think now that they're sort of they're going through the process of these academy stages and the knockouts and all the rest of it, you're actually seeing a bit more of what happens. What, what do you need to do and, how, and the, the kind of feedback and the idea of improving. I actually don't think that it's necessarily all bad. I think it does obviously give a rather unrealistic expectation of how long you need to, to put in to, to achieve, obviously. Um, and I think we, we did some work with children about 10 years ago on that, which is where the, the data about a third of children not being interested came from. And children were very aware of what they had to do to succeed. And I, I was quite surprised because you sort of imagine, oh, they think it's this mystical experience and, you know, the, cl the classical music world is something that they're not interested in and they're not really, they don't have that knowledge of. But they were saying, you know, yeah, it takes time, it takes dedication, it takes effort. And a lot of them said that they could do it, but that they actually didn't want to. Um, and I, whether that's a negative self-perception and saying, well, I don't want to put the effort in because I might not be any good at it at the end of the day. Uh, it's a rather precarious career. You know, there's all those kinds of things that are going to play a role here. And, and children develop a sense of their, their own musical identity very much based on the experiences that they have. And so raising their opportunities, I, I hope I'm not creating the idea that I'm saying that I don't think we should give people opportunities. I think absolutely that's absolutely critical because if you haven't had those experiences of music of lots of different types, I mean classical music is only one, um, and I don't think we were really just talking about classical music, any of us, um, but that's just one kind of music. You need to give people lots of experiences to find something that they're going to, to get excited about and that is going to sustain them through their life. And it might be that it's it's musical knowledge and it might be that it's musical understanding and it might be that it's musical performance and it could be in many different genres and it may be something that's, that's very latent. We've been doing some work at the moment looking at people who've come back to music after 20, 30, 40 years of not doing it and later in life they sort of say, hang on a minute, that time I spent when I was a child on something, I think I'd like to have another go at that. Um, and that's proving very rewarding. That's kind of a very popular thing at the moment, people going back to music after many years. So these things are, are, are long time frames and lots of opportunities. Um, and I think, you know, the, the way we provide these opportunities is absolutely critical. Okay. Well, Alan, do you think you've been too pessimistic now? Is it, if people can get funding for projects like this and by saying it's going to help, help society and, and then you do these uh, great stuff, what's the problem? Well, there's a few problems. I mean, firstly, obviously people do what they have to to get money. So uh, there is a difference between people ticking out boxes, and obviously they do that pragmatically, and often they do it somewhat cynically, although it does become part of the fabric of an outlook, unfortunately. But there's a difference between... But, but that isn't about having a high regard for the work and the culture in and of itself. And I, think, I really like Nicola's point about, you know, putting ex expectations that adults place on kids. And, you know, we're all talking like that. Yeah, this is just generally what goes on. We should recognise that that is not the norm today. The whole idea of pushing people and getting them to stretch and expecting standards and saying, we know better than you and you're not very good, but if you work really, really, really hard for a long, long time, you may get really good. 
That's not normal today. Just, I mean, I'm interested to hear what the audience thinks, but I mean, that's just kind of not normal. And I think that um, one of the things is kids might well get it, but they'll get it a lot more if adults get it. And if we valued things in our culture and we actually kind of had a reverence for things that were beautiful and, and, and marvellous and could say things like they're important and there is a distinction between Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or the Triple Concerto to something that's on Pop Idol and say it without feeling embarrassed as though you're somehow this terribly arrogant, out of touch zombie, then we'd be in better shape. I want to say one other, a couple of other points. David Lister made a funny point today in The Independent saying that if Pink Floyd wanted to get on uh, 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 wanted to get through the first round, they wouldn't today. And I, you know, I had a lot of experience trying to get um, a documentary about the composition of a new triple concerto, which is not in the repertoire generally, and get it broadcast internationally. And it is really difficult because commissioning editors, this is what they say, we get it, we think it's fantastic, but, but you, know, you people... You don't really get that cultural thing. It's, you know, and they're not going to want it. We don't do classical music. So in the end, the whole thing is that the gatekeepers blame ordinary people thinking it's too stuffy. But actually, the people who are responsible for culture and, and, and promoting that, putting it out there, have lost their nerve. And that trickles down. So when what's cool, how can you, know, you, you get inspired by things that are brilliant and when, when society reveres it. And if we don't, then the kids may get it, but they may not. OK, thanks. Tom, do you want to add anything? We've got your uh, not, not particularly to that, okay. well, just generally. I can spiel if you like, but yeah. Well, shall we go to the audience then? Sure, uh, let's do I'll that. come back to you first. <laughs> okay, um, who'd like to speak? Um, so I'll take a group of questions, if there is a group, um, immediately behind and then at the front here. Um, so questions or comments, feel free just to come up. Um, yeah, I just seek some reassurance from Alex. It's a question about the secondary curriculum. Um, I recognise many benefits about it, um, one being that uh, teachers are trusted to teach um, and another being that there's flexibility in what they teach at Key Stage 3. Um, but my fear uh, now, and it's the same as when it was unveiled to me in a conference, um, is that Western art music really isn't um, safeguarded. Uh, and I love teaching popular music as much as classical music. Um, but my fear is that there's a danger that teachers will teach what they think the kids want, what's most low maintenance, uh, and so on. Um, so I'm worried about content, and I'm worried about choice, actually, and, and choice is something you talked about. Okay, thanks. Um, it's at the front here. I think, I think Alan's absolutely right. <clears throat> really, the mood of the age is that classical music somehow stuffy, pop is what it's all about. And this is projected by politicians. <clears throat> Blair probably did a great deal to um, influence that, and everything was cool, Britannia and rock. So you had a Queen's Jubilee, so what do you do? You have a rock musician. You have the Millennium, you have a rock. You go to the Dame, and uh, as a site apology to classical, someone comes on and plays a cello from Emmett, and thank God they're off. We've got something really to make us with. And it's interesting, the, the debate I heard just before was about engaging the public, and there was a lady on the panel who was, uh, was a, uh, did poll, polls, and she said, she asked the public what they thought of politicians, and they said the trouble about politicians, just before the election, they all pretend they like something which they think the public wants, so they all um, ascribe to a football team or, or a rock thing or something like that. <clears throat> and it was sort of indicative to listen, actually, to David Cameron's um, Desert Island Disc. Every single one was a rock band or something like that. And he had Dylan right at the beginning, and all he could say about Dylan was that it was a live concert, and therefore you could hear the crowd clapping wasn't that great. And you suddenly realize it's a sort of dumbing down. So it's a sort of circular process. The politicians think that classical music is so... Uh, is so elitist, and then they tell the people, and then the people say that, and then the authorities who actually know about it, they then say, oh, well, actually, it's a social policy, so we might possibly do it. Just listen to the last night of the proms, and you've really got a, <clears throat> an example of people actually enjoying classical music. Okay, if you pass the microphone behind you, and then it's on the far back. Um, I, I really agree with the things that the, the panel are saying about wanting to enjoy music for its own sake and teaching it for its own sake. Um, but there's a particular problem with classical music in that it is an extraordinarily good tool of social policy. 
and uh, perhaps more than almost any other art form, it is a, a very effective way of engaging with young people and giving them certain things that they might not find in other parts of their life. So the degree of technical proficiency that's required to learn a musical instrument, particularly an orchestral instrument, the degree of coordination and teamwork when in an ensemble or working in an orchestra, um, you know, the degree of discipline and training and hard work and practice, the values that it imbues. So uh, in a sense, whilst I, you know, I strongly agree that classical music, like other forms of music, should be things that we appreciate for their own sake, that they have become actually quite fashionable in the last four or five years. And you've seen these projects springing up, like the Elsa Stemmer projects in Scotland and in Harmony in London. And I wish them very well. I hope they do really well. And they have you know, been extraordinarily successful. What's the problem then? I think the problem is that there has been a fascination from policymakers, and I include myself and many other people inv involved in the, kind of the arts administration world, um, in creating projects that deal with social problems around music. And that takes up quite a lot of money, it takes a lot of, lot of funding, a lot of resource. And there has been at the same time a decline or a diminution of music education as a structure, as a thing that happens in society which is normalized, which is part of the mainstream experience of young people who are not from deprived backgrounds as it happens, but you know, kind of the average you know, person who doesn't come from a, um, a, a poor council estate, if you like. They're not seen as being the obvious recipients of, class, of music education. And I think you know, Tom's point was um, really important, that there is, a, there is a need for a structure, there is a need for music education, which is taught as part of a wider arts education, liberal education system. And that because it's expensive to teach in that way, it has become increasingly difficult to continue that structure. So that's why you have this proliferation of initiatives. And I think that the Henley Review, whatever it might lead to, hopefully will restore this view that music should be something that's taught as as an educational thing, not just as a project, not just as a way of delivering all sorts of other benefits, but that it's, you know, it, it's something that we should value. Okay, thanks. There's one more um, in the middle, and then we'll come back for some responses. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm a bit nervous. I'm, well, surprised and interested, actually. Oh, maybe it's a better way to put it. Um, the focus that people put on doing music um, I think music's very much become something that people do, um, rather than, say, something that you learn about or something you learn the history of, or um, certainly in education, as was mentioned, that you, you learn how to listen to. And I think perhaps part of that focus on the doing of music is it's because very much where the sorts of social benefits are located through the discipline, through the, uh, you know, working very hard, through me meeting other people, um, and, and so on. Whereas there are actually a lot more things that we could get from music thought of in its own terms. Just leading on from that, I do think there's an interesting question of what do you do with those children who are not particularly turned on by music? And I think what's happening is a sort of conflation between those children who really do want to take it on and your average child who can't sing um, and is totally tone deaf or, or whatnot. And I think that reflects a certain crisis in music education um, itself. So I think the two sort of could do with separating out a bit. So we have a clear project for what's happening in schools and then a clear project for what might be happening um, with other children. I think the most negative consequence of what's happening at the minute is what I think is a sort of a new elitism, um, whereas the children that often are going forward are the, the children of, of middle class, you know, that, that sort of idea, the children of middle class um, parents who have the extra money and whatnot to take it forward. So I, I sort of think it's worth questioning um, how much uh, these new initiatives actually are. I mean, good though they are, to what extent they are, they are actually solving the problem. Um, and sorry, just finally one point, um, final point. Um, I do think it's important that children are turned on to the benefits of, of classical music, but I'm sort of interested, if that is the case, why is it that we don't have a vibrant adult culture in society that is valuing classical music in the way we might want if children are so turned on to the benefits. So is there something sort of easy about persuading a child um, they should do something, being a child? Um, you can persuade them of all sorts of uh, crazy stuff. Um, but there's something sort of different when it comes to, to trying to persuade adults that, that that's something to do. Um, so is there, is there a broader question there socially in, in terms of how we think about it over and above the, the obvious educational uh, point? Okay, thanks. Lots to come back on there. Tom, do you want to... Yeah, can I, can I just... It's, look, the, the best possible answer to the elitism question is Elsa Stamer, quite, quite self-evidently. Uh, there was um, 
an American blog in the Washington Post said that the, the sort of, uh, cynically in a way, but the genius of El Sistema in terms of how it's been promoted around the world is precisely that it gives classical music a reason to continue to exist because, in fact, it gives it back exactly as we know it. It gives the same repertoire that we all like, Tchaikovsky symphonies, Beethoven symphonies, Mahler symphonies occasionally. So it gives it, it, gives it a reason to still exist. But it is also true, I mean, undoubtedly true in Venezuela and, and, and of course, in Scotland, that, um, that, you know, that the, the kids who are on these projects don't have any sense about any elitism because they're doing it. So that's the simple way of getting around that problem. So just a couple of other things I'll pick up on. The thing to say about El Sistema, however, is that there's, there, there's obviously there's El Sistema Scotland. There are three In Harmony projects which have been fu funded up to 2011. Uh, Cultural Minister Ed Vasey said to my program on BBC Radio 3 before the election that he would guarantee that funding after 2011. He's now not quite, but almost reneged on that commitment. So there's a big question mark on whether those three projects will in fact still be funded after 2011. And I th that leads me on really to the next point, which is to say we do have an extraordinary network of music, music provision in this country through the lo local education authority music services. And I really think publicly, and again, I think the media really, is, I include myself in that, of course, are partly responsible for this, I think, grotesque distortion of what El Sistema is in this country at the moment. Look, if we're serious about rolling something out that would be meaningful to as many possible children across with, with uh, uh, giving uh, uh, people access to classical music because it tends to be the most expensive thing, the thing that people need access and opportunity to. It's quite simple. What you do is you go back to what happened in the 70s. You can make all music service provision across the country free at the point of provision. It's really, really simple. As opposed to a system where people are currently having to charge for their, for increasingly for their peripatetic um, uh, tuition and all, and all those sorts of things, which will clearly increase uh, no matter what the results of the Henley Review are. It, there's a really, really simple answer to this. And, uh, and it's a in my mind, the sort of fetishization of the absolutely wonderful work that Sustainable Scotland and the In Harmony projects are doing at the moment is terrific. But we need to look at what's going on here and say, look, if we want to value it, it's really, we just give it more money, we make it free. I mean, it, you know, it, it, that is the simplest possible answer uh, to um, a lot of these questions. There's one final thing uh, I wanted to say, but I can't really remember what it was now, so that's fine. I'll, uh, I'll come back to that later then. Uh, Nicola, uh, one particular thing, I mean, this is, I guess a suggestion, obviously um, uh, middle class families who are musical and want to pay for music lessons, that continues. And then you have um, projects like yours, it, which are targeted at people in more deprived areas. Um, I mean, do you think that's a model that could be rolled out? It seems, uh, is there a, a kind of gap in the middle of, of the, the average, um, and we're not really talking about music education on a national level? Mm -hmm. um. Okay, a couple of thoughts. First of all, I think that um, you mentioned there was a kind of fascination or a, an interest in these um, projects, these initiatives. I don't think it's an interest. I don't think it's a fascination. I think it's an awakening of the, the power and the responsibility, actually, that we have within our hands and the tools that we have within our hands and we haven't been fully realising. So for me, to call it a fascination or an interest is actually undermining the great... Um, the great ability and tools that we actually have. And I feel that with the Sistema movement and with um, Jose Antonio, who's been uh, driving this, he's actually opened our eyes to the, the tools that we already have and the responsibility that we should have. Um, I want to pick up on something actually that was mentioned really early on about why should musicians feel that they should have to address these things as well. I truly believe that there's a new movement happening and it's um, musicians that are coming out of the conservatoires that are passionately want to use their skills, who are realising this and who want to use their ability to shape society as well. So I don't think it's that people feel that they have to. I genuinely believe that there is a movement happening as well. And also I'll back that up by saying when we, um, we were opening for recruitment for musicians this summer, we had over 200 applications from musicians all over the world who wanted to come and work in rap rock in Scotland. Um, so I think that's kind of evidence to support that as well. Um, the model of middle class paying um, deprived communities having it for free, um, not quite sure that fits comfortably with me, um, but I must say to Tom's point about just make music provision free, there are still local authorities in Scotland where music provision is free for all young people. That doesn't mean that the, most, the young people who would benefit most from access that because 
free access does not mean removing all the barriers. And no, again, no, I mean that as a first step, Nicola. I mean that requires empowering the local education authority music services, many of whom have extremely good people, a brave equivalents in their own regions, who are equally passionate, equally visionary about the music making that they want to see happening in their regions. It's a question of empowering those people, and then you could get this thing happening more. Because the reality of, of, of El Sistema and, and In Harmony as they exist at the moment is there will be islands of possibility. The three in England won't be funded after 2011, it's my hunch then what are we left with? You know, I, I'm saying that we have people who are equally visionary as Jose Antonio Abreu mm -hmm. in this country. Um, to support them to, to reach their potential. Hmm. I suppose, I mean, just um, to reminisce slightly, I mean, I mean, it's a long time since I was at school, but my only mem I memory of, um, of, of music education at school was um, Casio keyboards and playing three blind mice over a uh, uh, calypso background. At that. And there really wasn't a, an interest. Anyone who wanted to go further than that, um, it would depend whether their families had them doing it. And there wasn't a sense of here's how you, what, what to, how you should appreciate music and so on. I mean, that, that for me came um, much later. But it does seem very sparse. I mean, if, if you're lucky enough to have the right context, whether it's because you're rich or, or you're poor, um, uh, that's there. But it, it seems that the question doesn't arise, let's teach us, these kids about music just, just for the sake of it. There has to be some reason for it. I mean, there's a very good reason for it, but is it a problem for anyone else? Does it, does it mean it's going to stop at this instrumentalism, uh, Tom? Um, or just to respond to anything else? Fine, yeah, I have a number of things to say. Is it going to stop at this instrumentalism? Um, hopefully not, this is the, 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 the short answer. Um, the white elephant in the room was obviously money and funding. Um, it's plain and simple. If, you know, if teachers were better paid, and I mean that completely, and I know some of the public sectors, you know, jobs are not as equally paid, but I still think teachers should be better paid. You would get better musicians going into the teacher, teacher profession. Why do politicians don't get music? Because it is difficult. It is, is it, I agree with the comments at the back about the whole, the holistic nature of the curriculum. You know, you've got history, you've got listening, you've got practical doing, you've got composition. It is so multifaceted. It is difficult. In order to get that well taught, you need fantastic, inspirational people. Which brings me on to the next point, which is these are, it's, it's, it, the, this work is um, helped by fantastic individuals. And Tom's right in that we have a country full of them, but their hands are tied because they just don't have the budget to do it. Um, in terms of eager pupils and the people who are not eager in music, well, I think that's absolutely just fine. I think. You cannot make someone learn the violin or be interested in Beethoven or indeed anyone, any other type of music if they don't like it. Some people just don't like music or just they're not interested in it. But they might have an interest in something else which is practical. And this brings in another element of maybe a whole round of the curriculum, which is this loss of skill and loss of practical education, whether it's tools of the trade or anything in, 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 that, in that world. People, I, I still think in, the, in our education system, pupils are not given this opportunity to be practical and pushed in that, in that uh, level. Too much focus is on academics and grades, and not enough is, on about, is, is about the skills involved, and that is something which music can bring. Um, that's, that's enough for the moment. I mean, just the other thing about projects. Um, I think something else which uh, relates back to this money issue is the fact that arts organisations construct projects which are socially beneficial, because the trust funds will only fund you if you construct projects which are socially beneficial. It's just, you know, it's a vicious circle. You know, you apply, apply to many of the, the, the larger trust funds now, and they have to show inclusion, social benefit, working with a range of people from different areas. Um, if you want to do a project which is completely artistic and for the value of art, you will just not get funded. It is as simple as that, and it will get even worse in the next few years, I can assure you. Okay, thanks. Alex, if you want to anything, but was that question about the curriculum in particular? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, safeguarding Western art music. Actually, I don't think you really need to be concerned because most teachers' experience of music at secondary level is overwhelmingly classical. There's been quite a lot of surveys done with this. Uh, so. The, the idea of, I mean, it wasn't, my, I, I didn't design the curriculum and I'm not holding my hands up and taking any responsibility for it, but we were involved in some of the discussions that, that went into it. I think the point was to try to, to be as broad as possible to allow people to teach the things that they feel comfortable with. And I think that's really important. And it is about empowering teachers to do what they want to do within certain constraints. I think there's a, a whole other debate, which I'm not sure we're having here, but we, we can do if you want to, about um, whether classical music is, is 
something that everybody should have the chance to learn about. Um, I think it will be variable, but what I think is more important is that music education inspires children to be interested in music. And having got that depth of knowledge of something, it doesn't matter what it is, they can then transfer it to different musical contexts at different points in their lives. There's some good research by Lucy Green on how that kind of process might work. Um, so I think, I, mean, I, mean, I think the idea is to be flexible and to allow teachers to do what they want to do. Just to come back to my point about um, children who are not interested in making music, I just want to make sure that everyone's clear that that is what I was talking about. I wasn't talking about children who aren't interested in music. There, are, there aren't children who aren't interested in music. But it's just that their, their interest in music may not marry with the opportunities that they're being given. So this third of children w said they didn't want to learn a musical instrument at school. That's the question that we were asking them. So they didn't want whole class violins. They didn't want one-to-one -one electric guitars or drums or some of the things that the other children were saying that they wanted to do. They said that they were happy learning about music in the classroom and doing, listening to a lot of music in their own time. So it's not that they're disaffected with music as a whole. It's that they didn't want to learn an instrument. And that's where, I think, coming back to the comment made about projects, all the effort has been in recent years on following on from David Blunkett's pledge that, pledge that every child should have the opportunity to learn a musical instrument. And we've got so hung up on that that we've lost sight of the other bits of music, like, for example, listening. Um, we're going to be doing some work on Tom and I are working together on a, a listening project. Um, but this is something that has lost every priority because it's all about whether you can play an instrument. Now, that's one way into music, but it's only one way into music, so we get that kind of issue. And I think the other problem about the projects is that, yeah, absolutely agree with the comments that have been made, that they're brilliant in themselves, but the trickle-down effects are not really going to happen because the funding required for an intensive project like Nicholas is fantastic for the children involved, but I can't see how we can... How, other people can learn little bits from that and sort of water it down because the whole principle is immersion. So if you haven't got the money for the immersion, then you're not going to get off the ground. I think I echo Tom's comments again about music services. I have, have excellent people in them and they were doing a brilliant job of things. And the, with all this emphasis on participation, we've even got a musical participation director at the DC whatever it is nowadays. DCMS. <laughs> DCMS. Um, somebody whose job is to get people participating in music. Um, this is, you know, this is... We've lost sight of all the other parts of music, and I think we've got to recognise that everybody has different ways of coming to this at different times. And we've got to have impact when we do research and when we design projects, where we think about how it's going to go and what the trickle-down effects are going to be. We wouldn't get money for things if it just applied to a small group of children. We've got to be thinking more widely, but maybe Nicola wants to comment on that, because I'm sure it's <laughs> more relevant. I, mean, I just have one point, just to chip in. Is that, I, mean, I don't know if, there, if this is happening or not with the... Um, big noise project, but it, wouldn't it be wonderful if all of the teachers in that area were involved in the system too, so that they could be learning the skills which they need to really improve their music education in the classroom? I mean, this is this is. I mean, what Alex was saying is this transfer of skills from the people and the experts who are jollying around all around the country doing projects, which is fantastic. But how does that? How is that then transferred into into the classroom so that work, that work can happen every week? Okay, I know Alan wants to come in, but Nicola, do you want to respond very quickly on that? Um, so, in terms of directly to answer you, some of the teachers do get involved, some don't, so they choose, and we don't enforce that at the moment. Um, but I would say that there is something that a specialist musician who's specifically chosen to do this job adds, and that can't ever be completely transferred, those skills, to the classroom as much as you want to share those skills as possible. And actually, our musicians have learned a heck of a lot from the classroom teachers as well of how to work with the children. Something I do want to mention is regarding money and funding. It's also always such a difficult topic. Um, when we started this programme, we were not given any money. Um, this, we were set up as a charity. We got some, we got some start-up funding from Scottish Arts Council. I think the way that thinking has to change is that often I come across people that say to me, ah, oh, but if I had the amount of money that you had, then I could do that. Well, I didn't have any money. And I think often people try to design projects or programs for the amount of money they think they can apply for or they have or they think they can get. How we developed this um, was that we looked at the Venezuelan system and said, what is the program we think we have to develop long-term, generational, that will change the lives of the children in the community? And then how much does that cost? And then we will fight tooth and nail and we will work day and night until we go to our graves to make that happen. And we're still doing that. So I think there is, again, a sort of transfer of responsibility um, where I know that funding's difficult. 
Um, but if you want to take it on, then you have to take it on and you have to fight to find it. Okay, thanks. Alan, and I'll come back for any questions. Okay. Um, a couple of things that Nicola said, though, that I'm really not sure about. She said earlier on that one of the comments was that it's making our community a family again, and then later went on to say that that, they, that then the people involved in this want to use their ability to shape society. And I think the thing is that there's always a danger that one gets evangelical about going beyond the thing that it is that's important to do. I think the important thing to do is to do great work and do it brilliantly. And let's be honest, a tiny proportion of people are going to go on to be professional musicians and a tiny, tiny, tiny group within them are going to be soloists. That does not mean that there isn't value in, in um, uh, pursuing this kind of life. A couple of other quick points. Um, my own experience at my school was quite a good one, but sometimes it reminds me of Fellini's The Orchestra. We had this really amazing uh, guy who, who basically had the world record for playing the most amount of instruments, and we had several hours uh, throughout the week, about three or four sessions, where he really worked us hard, and sometimes I hated it. And I wasn't particularly... I was one of the people who wasn't very good, and you, very quickly you get to see where you stand in it. But it was an amazing experience and a sense that this mattered in our school and, and in, in, in our community. And there was a general sense that you were privileged to be involved with that, but there were lots of people who didn't choose to do that and didn't want to be. And th now it comes to the point about funding, because it's impossible to have a discussion about resources unless you talk about politics. Right? And unless you're up, able to get up and say, we completely reject the notion that it's elitism and it shouldn't be for everyone, and we think it, it's important in and of its own right, and it's going to have no impact on society whatsoever. No, it's not going to do anything about racism, not going to do anything about housing policy, not going to do anything about unemployment, none. What it's going to do is hopefully produce some fantastic music and some good musicians. I think there should be the opportunity that we could argue that for everyone. Not that everyone should be forced to do it, but that we give it, we bestow it within our cultural realm uh, properly. And we have, but that takes some very hard arguments that are cultural and political. And you're going to come up against issues of elitism. And you can't dodge those bullets by sort of somehow trying to talk about sort of community and positive impacts. I think we have to do it in and of its own right. Okay, and um, we could keep going. We've got 15 minutes. Um, uh, so if any further questions from, from the audience, we'll bring those in now. Um, um, there's a lot more for the panel to talk about, but yes, okay, good. Um, over here, then yourself, and then over there. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the idea of going a little bit further down the, the, the road of arguing for, for art and for music for its own sake. Um, I think that's very, it's been very unfashionable for a long time, and I sort of, I think I grew up in a weird little pocket somehow, because I... I grew up in Hertfordshire, which has a fantastic um, music service. I grew up in a school that was um, part of the North Hearts Music College um, building. So we had our music lessons at the North Hearts Music College over the bridge from our school. Um, and they were subsidised a little bit, but um, lots of people's parents, because we had such fantastic provision, would basically forego all family holidays. No, m most of my friends didn't go on family holidays, but we all had music lessons. Um, and that sort of carried on the right the way through our, our school careers. And it was, it was sort of pushed as being really, really important for its own sake. And I don't think that was happening in the rest of the country. Um, so when I got to university, I met very few people who had learned to play as many instruments as me and my friends had. Um, and I will never be a professional musician. And that was never the point of having these lessons or being part of that. Um, it was to understand music, to learn how to do it, to learn how to enjoy it. Um, and it will be with me for the rest of my life. And I re I'm really interested in how you make that a political argument because it seems like a, an argument that hasn't been made for a while um, and that the social value has been placed far and above um, anything else that, that may be important. And I, I would really like to hear from all of the, the panellists how you think we can frame that debate in a way that is more political, more proactive and likely to yield results. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, yeah, I'd just like to kind of take issue with something that's sort of come up a couple of times and this sort of concept that politicians are kind of enforcing contemporary music on school children, sort of just because they decided it was cool. I would argue with that in that, like, I know from um, the school that I sort of grew up with, there was, you know, the music in school was very much sort of yeah, playing the piano or doing the violin. It was all orchestral and it was a lot of fun. And a lot of pupils were in their own time, you know, playing in 
bands and faxing loads and writing their own music and organizing gigs themselves. And they weren't counted, that sort of musical effort wasn't counted in the school because that wasn't recognized. So I'd say, on the other end, I think, you know, recognizing that people love, you know, a rock band or a punk band or whatever, I don't think the focus should always be as much on classical music as much as I like it. I think that sometimes these, these politicians just didn't wake up and say, you know, I'm going to decide that I like rock music. Just, you know, they didn't just do it out of the blue. I think there is some value in that, although they might be using it for their own sort of popularity. I don't think it should be written off that easily. Okay. Gordon Brown might not like the Arctic Monkeys, but lots of people do. Um, I think there was a hand right at the back, but over here. Or you, just there. Me? Yeah. Like um, in Birmingham, where I live, they're halfway through building a new library, new central library called the Library of Birmingham. It's a piece of landmark architecture that's supposedly going to regenerate the city and put it on the, on the cultural map. And one of the things that they, they're putting in, um, according to their website, are DJ rooms for young people to come in and play. And it, it stri strikes me that one of the... It alludes to one of the problems that's been... been uh, we've had over the last few years is, or two I would say, one is relevance, the idea that things have to be relevant, especially in, in urban, inner city areas, um, and also expectations. Um, and I thought this, I've been following the um, Sistema project over the, the last few years, and uh, one of the things that struck me when I heard about the Scottish project is, is do we, are we prepared to really push our kids in the way that they probably would do in, uh, in um, Central or, or, or Southern America. And it, it, I remembered a report on Radio 4 be before the Chinese Olympics where Matthew Pinson went to a, gym, a gymnasium, a Chinese gymnasium, uh, talking about what was going on over there. And he just basically said, it's just child abuse, what they're doing to the kids over here. You know, they, he just couldn't even conceive. I mean, they probably do have quite a difficult life, but couldn't conceive that you could really, really push kids for excellence. And it strikes me that what, what they what the unique thing, what they, they've done in Venezuela is really, really push their kids. Uh, and that is, and, and especially working class kids, that's what we really need to do. My, just briefly, my, my experience of um, um, education, uh, music education in school was pretty disastrous, but at least the teachers did really try, you know, it's a really thankless task to uh, try to introduce us to classical music uh, and, you know, probably felt like they got no reward for it. So uh, whether that's really happening today uh, uh, or, or over the last few years, I'm really not sure. Okay, thanks. So some, someone in the middle, and was there anyone else at the back? Did I make that up? Okay, so this is the last one, and then we'll come back to the panel for final remarks, and I'll do it in reverse order. Um, when I first heard about this debate, I, uh, music and social policy, I, I, the first thing that sprung to my mind was, um, is this like the Pied Piper? What, what's it trying to sort of uh, achieve? Um, and whilst... From what I've heard about Il Sistema so far, it sounds very good. Um, this issue about the potential dangers, um, I think that's something that should always be sort of kept um, in the forefront of people's minds who have these projects. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, the last thing I wanted to throw in is a few people have talked about um, listening. And when we talk about instrumentalism in music and, and just in social policy, it does tend to be the participation which is focused on and, and the benefits of that rather than appreciation perhaps, I mean obviously it'd be difficult to, to perform music without getting some sense of how to appreciate it, but I wonder if anyone wants to talk about that, it's quite an old fashioned idea that classical music is sort of good for you, um, edifying in some way. It should be allowed to be very bad for you. Okay. That's the, and this is part well, of the problem. With well, yeah, well, music, so. well you, I mean, you mentioned um, Beethoven's Ninth. I happened to, to watch um, Clockwork Orange recently, in which where, where Beethoven's Ninth literally is a soundtrack to, to, to rape and, violence, and violence. Um, but even if you think of stuff like the, the, the demonization of heavy metal and satanic influences and you know, rap and very good things, things. And that's the irony of that. Um, which goes to maybe um, uh, uh, Alex's point about the, the psychology um, making people cheap and so on, that it can be a, a bad thing. So is, is that of interest at all? Or should we be talking about how people listen to music and what it means, which might suggest some forms of music are better than others, or do we adopt an amoral approach? Anyway, that's just my interest, but there's lots to talk about, so Tom, I'll let you that right. All right, uh, listen, I'll just de deal with that amorality question. This will be good. I'll sum it up in 90, 60 seconds. Here you go. Uh, it's, it, these, all these types of music do different things. I was uh, talking about Berlioz recently, someone who uh, hatched a plot to murder his fiancée, the person he'd just become, she'd just become engaged to, and the person she was, the, her new 
fiance and their mother uh, whilst he was composing Harold in Italy and other compositions. Classical music, good for you? I don't think so. You know, any of those moral questions are complete and utter garbage. What the, the, the point is that this music does different things and we, you can choose to listen to it or not listen to it or engage with it or not engage with it in the way that you want. Um, there's something that Virgil Thompson, an American composer, called the music appreciation racket. And I think slightly the danger with going back to listening is that you, you, you're slightly in danger of, of revivifying that. Uh, look, different genres of music do different things. I was listening to Iron Maiden's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner before I came out. It was a bit of, you know, uh, peffing me up. And, uh, you know, it's fantastic. It, you know, it's music that is just as, it's not quite as rhythmically, it doesn't do it quite for me in the same way that Beethoven 7 does in terms of rhythmic abandon, but it's pretty good, you know. <laughs> Um, now, uh, I want to come back to the point you made about how you, uh, how you make the argument about to politicians that we say it's for its own. I mean, you were very lucky in Hertfordshire. I know a lot, met a lot of people who come from those orchestras. Really, really fantastic place to have been. Uh, the irony is here, um, that Elsa Stamer is a pretty good model for this. Uh, given now that we have so much attention around it, if you say, look, if you want the Simon Bolivar Orchestra in Hertfordshire, which you virtually have anyway, I mean, why is it? You know, the Rest Royal Festival Hall, Teresa Carreño, Simon Bolivar, Youth Orchestra from Brazil. Come on, we've got youth orchestras here. It's not just the poshos and the National Youth Orchestra of Great Britain. We've got really good youth orchestras in our music services who we should be celebrating. If we, if we, want, to, if we want to say, look, do you want, Ed and Jeremy, a, a Simon Bolivar? Wouldn't it be wonderful if in the next five years we could say, here is you a Simon Bolivar? They're there. You can make it happen quite straightforwardly. Um, that's my direct answer to that. I'll let other people have a go. Okay, thanks. thanks. Alex? Uh, there's, a lot, well, there's a lot to respond to, but... Um, but I've sort of said pretty much everything that I wanted to say. I mean, yeah, the listening effects, uh, we, could, we could have another hour and a half on that, but I guess we probably can't. So <laughs> um, I think that, yeah, listening to music is going to affect people, as, as Tom says, in lots of different ways. We know that the same piece of music can move us to tears or leave us completely cold, uh, you know, it matters where you are, who you're with, what time of day it is, how hot and cold it is, you know, a whole range of features in, uh, apart from our personal associations with music and all that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, I think, that, uh, in terms of the argument, I'm, I'm coming back to your point about how do we do this? How do we make this case without worrying about the instrumental benefits? And I, th I, I can't think that we can do anything other than just keep saying it, that music is beneficial for its own sake. And the more times we say that, from lots of different perspectives, and there's lots of different people sitting here saying this, um, we just keep saying it, and, we, and we, can, we can look at some of those other things, but we have to be very careful. Uh, I'm quite good friends with uh, someone who was involved with the Mozart effect research in the States, and she was absolutely devastated by the effect that, that research public the publication of that research had on the ways it was used as an instrumental thing, because they were just interested in what happens when you listen to Mozart. What happens in your brain? And it turns out that you're better at solving problems and doing puzzles and doing spatial temporal reasoning after you've listened to a bit of Mozart. They still, after all these years of research, don't know why well, but exactly. That, 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 was, that was debunked. That was science. That was disproven well, by your colleagues of yours to be absolute garbage. It was nothing to do with Mozart. It was to do with music and rhythmic patterning in the brain. Yeah. And that's been proven now. Yes, but what, what, the point I'm making, I suppose, is that what started as a piece of research, which was interested in what music does for us on a curious level, got manipulated into listening to this music makes you more intelligent. And that message, despite the research that's been done to debunk it, that message is still out there very powerfully. And the research was done with adults, and yet people are still playing Mozart to kids and saying it's going to help their brain power. It doesn't do anything. Um, but it, it's, it's a care, I think, and a responsibility that we have as researchers to make sure that those messages don't get mixed down, down the line. But so every time we do this kind of work, we have to keep saying music is important for its own sake. And we, uh, that's, that's all I can come up with. It's not terribly creative, but it's, it's a kind of, you know, by repetition, we might actually filter down somewhere. Music is important for its own sake. I'll say it again. <laughs> okay, thanks. Alan. Yeah, um, in the last session on where's the public gone, uh, one of the things that came out is a lack of leadership. And I think that's the first thing we have to address. We have to think about a lack of leadership today in the important issues, I'm not about politics. And it speaks to the question about what do we ask of politicians? Well, let's ask them to be involved in politics. Let's ask them maybe to take a lead and have some ideas that they want to convince us of, and they may stand a chance of losing. And let's ask them not to piggyback on things they think are popular or instrumentalist that they can get some benefit from, but actually to come up with some solutions themselves and run the risk that we say, no, you're rubbish, get out, and we can do it better, or whatever. Um, I think the thing about listening is really important. I, I was surprised actually to hear Tom say that, that we could go back to an old thing because I think that we, we could all do with listening better. I mean, I, I talked briefly about the 
I, I made a documentary about the triple concerto. When I listened to Beethoven's triple concerto, I didn't hear it properly for many times. And I, you, it's like anything. You have to develop a palette, and you have to like, really listen, and you have to concentrate, and you have to work. And some people think, well, I don't really want to do that. Now, let me just put it in context. I love popular music. In fact, when I used to put on acid house parties all around the world, one of the first ones we did in Sydney, when we did it um, uh, in a warehouse... We, we, at 12 o'clock, we put on Carlos Carmina Barana. It doesn't, the point is that it, you can play around with different things and have fun, but the important thing is that the gatekeepers and the people that are like, supposedly about representing the institutions uh, do it properly. Asia is a place we're seeing far more now people coming into the conservatories. If you go to Juilliard and you look at the faces, like with engineers, we're seeing them a lot come from Asia, Korea, China, and elsewhere, partly because of the standards, partly because of culturally it's bestowed as being important. Um, you know, I, I was involved in classical, classic FM TV for a while, and I think it's great that there's more avenues to put things out. But it's interesting on the homepage of the DCMS, uh, where, it, you know, where it says, 92% um, of youth music projects assist with the behavioral needs of young people, specifically building respect, confidence, and self-esteem. You see, and, and I think this is the thing we have to be very careful of and argue against. And I'd like to leave us with... Bernstein's, Leonard Bernstein's uh, comment when JFK was assassinated. And he said something very simple. He said, this will be our reply to violence, to make music more intensely, more beautifully, more devotedly than ever before. Okay, thanks. Uh, Nicola? Hmm. First of all, um, the Big Noise programme in Systema Scotland is about using the orchestra to, um, to transform lives. But we absolutely love all music, and we encourage our children to love all music. And you'll never catch me up here dissing any music, because I love it all, and you'll find that from my iPod as well. So, um, but we believe that there's something um, very, very special about the orchestra that has a unique ability to do, um, to, to unite and to, to transform lives. I want to particularly pick up on the question over here, which was, are we prepared to push our children in the way that they do in South America? Um, I have to tell you, I have been to Venezuela several times. There is no child abuse going on in the El Sistema <laughs> model over there. Um, also, I think it is interesting to note that, that they work on the pursuit of excellence, but they have lots of different levels, so young people always find a progression that suits them. <laughs> but it is incredibly important that they believe in the pursuit of excellence. But I want to turn that question slightly on its head, because this is challenging for us as an organisation, because we're constantly trying to get better at this. I would turn it on its head and say, are we prepared to face up to realising the capacity of our young people? So I think it's a different question. And if we are, then how do we support our staff and our musicians to have the confidence to feel that they can help the children to realise that? And I was in Venezuela this summer, and the, something that just I felt when I came back was, how do you support musicians and teachers to teach fearlessly to enable young people to learn fearlessness? because that's what they need to try to take risks to really believe that they can achieve everything that they want for themselves. Great, thanks. Last word to Tom. Um, I would, again, I would agree with everything that's been said in the final comments. And for the person from Hertfordshire, um, it's difficult because we live in a, a, an age which wants everything to be quantified and, and judged. Um, and I think I, I have to go agree with Alex. You've just got to keep on pushing the message forward. And I think it will take time, but I think possibly we might get there and actually over the next few years past this financial hurdle, some interesting and different methods and models will come out of it. Um, I don't think we should be apologetic. In terms of other music, I think what the key is to find those transferable skills of listening to those different, those different musics and seeing, well, you're, you're listening to Iron Maiden, but actually there's things which you can pull out there and hear them in other musics too. That comes down to teaching and... I again go back to my general point about a generalist education which puts arts more at the centre of the curriculum. It, it doesn't need to be on the side. So that's what I, I would hope comes through over the next few years. Okay, thanks. Before we thank the panel, can I just announce there's one more set of sessions um, happening um, now in 15 minutes. Um, and then there will be a, a musical reception, in fact, with uh, music for voice and piano, um, excerpts from Mozart, Verdi and Tchaikovsky at the reception at Imperial College. If any of you are in New York next month, Alan has asked me to point out there are New York Salon events on tolerance and immigration. Um, but thanks to all the speakers, thanks to um, the RPS, and uh, thank you. Thank you.